My father was walking at the bottom of the hill with John McComb when I got home, who was the CIA director, who was one of the first people to get to the house. My father said to him, did your people do this? So his initial instinct was that the CIA had killed his brother. How, how effective was the propaganda campaign from CIA against your family? It was very, very effective. I mean, you know, for one thing, the, the word conspiracy theorist, that phrase was coined back then by the CIA. They sent a memo out after my father's death to all they, the CIA had at least 400 leading journalists in our country. And they had an operation called Operation Mockingbird which was an illegal operation to compromise American journalism. And they had some of the leading, in fact, Carl Bernstein in 1973 published a list of the 400, 400 journalists who were secretly working for the CIA. And they were from all the leading papers, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, Newsweek, a lot of the editors, a lot of the publishers of those were, you know, had signed uh, security agreements with the, uh, uh, with the CIA, and we're working, we're assets of the CIA. It was an illegal program. The CIA is allowed to propagandize around the world, and it's the biggest funder of journalism today in the world. It spends $10 billion a year um, through USAID to fund journalism all over the world. It owns some of the biggest newspapers and magazines, the most influential in, in the developing world, in Europe and around the world. But there was a, in the CIA's charter, it says, and then there was an act called the smith munt Act that makes it illegal for the CIA to propagandize Americans. So in 1973, there were congressional hearings that came out of the House Select Assassination Committee hearings when all the CIA secrets were, were revealed. They were called the family jewels. It was all of the worst secrets of the CIA that they all kept in one place. And that was released, um, you know, during the 1970s, during these hearings from the Church Committee and the House Select Assassination Committee. And Americans learned for the first time about, you know, Operation Mockingbird, but also about MK Ultra, MK Naomi, MK Dietrich. These were all of the MK stands for mind control. And the CIA was uh, had these programs at Fort Dietrich, but it. 220 universities around our country and in Latin America and Canada um, experimenting with ways to control the human mind. The LSD came out of that program. And, um, uh, you know, they were using psychoactive drugs. They were using torture. They were using uh, sensory deprivation. They were using noise, uh, um, <laughs> noise, uh, and and uh, and they were not. They were figuring out how to control individuals, including how to develop Manchurian candidates, unwilling assassins through a hypnosis and these you know other techniques. But also, how do you control whole societies through you know destruction of institutions, the propagation of lies, uh, um, you know instigated violence, and uh, the sort of the orchestrated. Uh, diminishment of faith in, in the institutions of society and the mistrust among people. So they had all of these, you know, the, they were experimenting. And, you know, it wasn't just the U.S. The same thing was happening in Russia and in other parts of the world. But, you know, we had a very, very sophisticated program that that, that violated a lot of American values. How, and, how effective do you think the MK Ultra program was? Well, I mean, there's a lot of things that came out of it. Um, and there's a lot of that, you know, it's hard to tell because a lot of it was top secret. I mean, it's very, you know, um, you know, it's a really interesting but and a very surprisingly well-documented history. Um, but, you know, I don't want it. But uh, the term conspiracy theorists, was there was a memo that went out to all of those journalists who were associated with the CIA in 1964, where they said that anybody who questions the Kennedy assassination, you know, the, the Warren report, which was the report 
that was done by a commission that was appointed by LBJ. And the commission was essentially told, and individual members were told, you got to say that this was a single gun and do not let people talk about a conspiracy theory. The, the, the named head of the commission was Earl Warren, who was a Supreme Court justice, but the real head of the commission was Alan Dulles, who had been this head of the CIA, who my uncle had fired. When my uncle died, he told a, journal, um, a young journalist, uh, oh, he thought he was a god. I'm glad the little shit is dead. And, you know, we now know that the CIA was directly involved in my uncle's assassination and in, and in the, you know, 60-year cover-up. They they're, they're continue to be involved. They're still not releasing, you know, the, um, the last assassination documents that are required by the JFK um, uh, Papers Act, the Assassination Papers Act. And the CIA still won't let the president release them. Why Trump didn't release them, I don't know. He promised he would. He did say, he said, I have here Donald Trump has allegedly said that he's looked at the classified JFK files and said that if the public saw what he saw, they wouldn't want the files released either. I mean, what? What does that mean? Yeah, what the hell is that? I don't know. Have you ever spoken to him about that? I have friends who have asked Trump about that. And and President Trump, one of my friends who asked about that, that President Trump said, I'm not going to talk to you about it on the phone. And, you know. Mike Pompeo was the director of CIA when it was supposed to be. You know what the interesting thing? I had dinner with Mike Pompeo a couple of months ago. I've never met him before, I, my, and I always had a bad opinion of him because I feel like he's like a warmonger. But I, when I actually met him and sat down with dinner with him, I found him incredibly charming and brilliant. And he, um, and you know, he and I have different ideologies and different views about what you know the, about the trajectory our country should go on. But I believe that his are sincerely held, that he's a man of principle and that he, um, you know, he just believes differently than I do. And, but, you know, he has, he was, a, you know, he was in a, the military. Uh, he was, uh, he went to Harvard. He went to Harvard Law School. He, I think he may have been a Rhodes Scholar. He really is like a, you know, exceptionally brilliant person. He said to me something really interesting. He said that, um, and I, you know, this is the first time I met him. And I started talking to him about the CIA, and he said, "My greatest regret in public life is I did not fix the CIA." And he said, "I had an opportunity to change the culture there, and I didn't do it. I left it alone." And he said, "The entire upper echelon of that agency." is made up of individuals who do not believe in the democratic institutions of the United States of America. That's a quote, what he said to me. My, my daughter-in-law, and I know that you had, you know, you, you've worked for this agency as well. My daughter-in-law was um, a in the clandestine services at the CIA. She's running my campaign now. I am a Fox Kennedy. She was in the clandestine services um, for her career in the weapons of mass destruction program. She went in, she joined right after 9-11 as, you know, an act of patriotism and idealism. And um, she spent the years since she left the agency uh, in a battle against the military industrial complex and winding down the war machine, which she, you know, got very, very much exposed to over there. But she says, look, there's 20,000 people who work for that agency, and most of them are um, idealistic um, public servants who have integrity and you know, love of our country and want to do the best thing. But she said the upper levels of the agency are completely like, contaminated and corrupted by, you yeah. know, by these uh, sort of neocon types. Yeah, it's been a all- it's been a long time since I've been over there, but it's a it's a damn shame. Where, oh, I, my, you know, you were asking about my my childhood. I I got um, 
So I had this extraordinary magical childhood that was, you know, where we, my house at Hickory Hill in Virginia was 10 minutes from the White House. My, my father was the most powerful person in government after my uncle. He had run my uncle's campaign. He was now his attorney general, but he was at a portfolio across all the agencies. And, you know, he's a young man, 35 years old, and he was running the government. And, and uh, he was deeply involved. The CIA was only minutes from my house. Um, and... I, it was it was a, a mile. We or less than a mile. We went. I went horseback riding every morning with my dad. We had each at that time there were nine kids, and each one of us had a horse. And my father would take us galloping across the countryside through the woods, et cetera, every morning before breakfast. And we'd always ride through the CIA campus. That's when the building was first being built, and the CIA um, had you know my father, my father and uncle fired. Dulles, but they replaced him with a guy called John McComb, who came to our house every day. We had Cuban um, uh, uh, brigade members from the, from the Cuban Brigade, 257 Brigade, who were at our house all the time. We had Green Berets climbing on the roof. On our, you know, the house was filled with all of the congressmen and senators. Every meal, there were Supreme Court justices who were, you know, members of the administration. A lot of the big programs, the civil rights um, program, were all directed from my house by my father. I would sit behind a couch in the living room when he ordered 20,000 troops down to the University of Alabama to, to integrate it and, and to Mississippi. So we were, I grew up in this extraordinary milieu. I'm very, very lucky to have kind of first front row seats. Um, at all of these events. And then my uncle was killed in 1963. Where were you when he was killed? I was, I was at school, Sidwell Friends School. I got picked up by my mom early. And she was driving us home, and I saw somebody. I saw them. I was at, at that. I was 10 years old. I was in uh, fifth grade. I, I went into first grade at five years old. I saw men hauling the, the uh, flags down to half staff. And I asked her why they were doing that. She hadn't spoken to me. And she said, a bad man shot Uncle Jack. And then I got home. My, my father, we, we lived on a five acre or seven acre farm right outside of Washington and uh, called Hickory Hill. And it was an antebellum mansion, you know, that uh, that had been Civil War. It had been John McClellan's house, uh, General McClellan, during the U.S. Civil War. Wow. And, um, and uh, it was a big house with like 25 rooms in it. You know, we had, like I said, 11 kids, and there was always guests in that house. And um, my father was walking at the bottom of the hill with John McComb when I got home, who was the CIA director, who was one of the first people to get to the house. My father, during that walk, and I ran down to give him a hug, and McComb laughed, but during that walk, my father said to him, did your people do this? So his initial instinct was that the CIA had killed his brother. He made two other calls that day, one to the CIA desk officer, in Langley, which again was less than a mile from my house, and he asked him the same question, and then he made the same call to Harry Ruiz, who is one of the leaders of the Cuban Brigade, and who was then staying in a, a hotel in Washington. And he asked him, you know, did your people do this? He, accept, he, he suspected it was the Cuban group that had done it. And um, so... Uh, he, you know, and then my father then, you know, really shut down for almost a year. He was so shattered by his brother's death. And he started slowly coming out of his shell. And, you know, he ran for Senate a year later in 1964 and won. And then he, you know, he became this incredible political force. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.